for sure I was going to say good morning, but managed to figure out what time of day it is. Uh, so excited that you have chosen to rejoin us again for the last session of our GROW conference. It has been such a blessing, hasn't it? I heard one yes, so at least one person has been blessed. <laughs> um, so we want to conclude this evening, um, and we're so excited you've chosen to join us either in person or online. Uh, but to begin the night, we're going to sing our theme song that we've been learning for the whole week that just really encapsulates um, the theme of what we've been learning, that our hope isn't here, but our hope is in Christ. It is in heaven, and it is sure, and it is secure, and that is something to rejoice in and to have joy in the midst of any circumstance. So we're gonna stand and sing about that to remind ourselves and each other as we sing these words to the Lord and also to each other to remind ourselves of the truth of them. So let's sing. Let's sing. Let's sing. Let's sing.
man, I really love that song. We might just start doing that a lot more now. <laughs> Father, we just thank you so much for the joy of worshiping in your presence and not not something that's just an emotional high, but Lord, we are worshiping and filled with joy that is based on truth, that is based on something solid and real that we can depend upon, and that is the gospel, that is the gospel of Christ, and the fact that our eternal hope and security can't be found here. It's not going to be found here. If we look for it here, we will be disappointed, but you do not disappoint. You bring a hope that does not disappoint, that is sealed with your spirit of promise. For all those who have placed their faith in the name of Jesus, who call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And we know that he who began a good work in us will bring it to the completion, to the day of the Lord. And so we, we just declare our joy to you for that truth. And we declare our dependency on you. God, we know that we did nothing to earn our salvation. And we know that we do nothing that really aids in our sanctification. And that's all you and your spirit working in and through us. So as we sing this next song, we just declare our dependency on you. And, and we humbly and gratefully do that, Lord, because we just recognize what a merciful and gracious and generous gift you have given us in Christ.
understand and receive the truth of your word so that we may be changed for our good and for your ultimate glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I know I'm a little partial but I think you guys got the best preaching and music in British Columbia. Um, I mean, really, the, the, the level of talent in this church is amazing. And uh, I just, I really love the singing. I really have. I'm, I miss you singing. I guess I had to just, I know, I know. It was, was non refundable. So. Uh, I just remembered Brittany and my little Joy singing so much when they were growing up, and they made little videos, and uh, it's, it, that's right. Man, those are good days. Um, okay, so uh, what I want to do tonight is uh, look at the last section of the book of Job, bring it to a close, and uh, what I, I asked the, the men in our prayer breakfast to pray for, that you would be encouraged by the book of Job, and that you would be equipped by the book of Job. So not just encouraged, but equipped in order to do the work of the ministry that God has called each one of you to as well. And that's, that's really the end of what I'm after here for God's glory to, to, uh, to be displayed and how God might use this in your life and in your church family as well. So turn with me to chapter 38. And uh, we're going to, if you have the text in front of you, that probably will be helpful because I'm, I'm going to do a lot of reading. I, I told you that the, uh, last night, I, what, we, what the book of Job does is saves the best for the last. Okay, so we've heard from Job. We've heard from uh, Bildad. We've heard from Zophar. We've heard from Eliphaz. We've heard from Elihu. Uh, and now we're going to hear from the, really one, the only one who matters. Finally, God's going to speak. And that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Because uh, what I said in the beginning, who started first? Well, Eliphaz started first. He was the oldest, and then Elihu was youngest, so he has to go last. Uh, back in the old days, uh, that's the way it was. Um, even at the dinner table, the, you know, the older people got to get stuff off the plate, and then whatever's left, we got, you know, the kids got what's left on the plate, at least where I grew up. None of you look at me like, oh, yeah, that's the way I was raised. I guess, <laughs> guess that didn't happen at your house, but... But also it was that your children were, you know, you, you kind of didn't just interrupt. You just, you would wait, you would wait until you were spoken to, right? The older people, uh, you, you gave them that respect. That's the way it used to be in the, in the days of Job as well. And, um, and so it, it's ironic that who, who speaks last? Not the youngest, the oldest. Who's older than God, right? He's older than creation because he's the creator, so actually, it's the oldest one who's going to now speak, and he's going to get the last word, and he's got a lot to say. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is he's been listening all along. Think about that. Every conversation he listens in on, your conversations, uh, your, your private and quiet conversations, every single word. He's been listening to Eliphaz. He's been listening to Elihu. He's been listening to Job. And uh, now, uh, for his own glory and for their own good, he speaks up. And uh, we begin in chapter 38, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. Uh, the old version of the Bible, like King James, said, gird, gird your loins. I will question you, and you make it known to me. All right, so in other words, everybody's been asking God, why, why, why? You know, they've been asking God questions. 
And he, so now God's going to interrogate them. All right, it, he's turning it around, and he's going to ask some questions. And in the next few chapters, is question after question after question. And uh, you know that when you ask a question and you do not expect an answer, that's called a rhetorical question. That's what these are. Because remember what I said from the beginning. God, when he asks a question, he, he's not looking for information. He already knows the answer. So this is called the Socratic method. Socrates used to use this with his disciples. It's a way of teaching by asking questions. So he's going to teach Job a lesson. And I, I bet you can pick it up pretty clear what the, what the lesson is. I love this verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Now, he doesn't wait for an answer, but what's the answer? Nowhere. <laughs> when, when God created the heavens and the earth. Now, and he's using poetic language as, as if he's building a house, right? So you start with a foundation. That's why he, he talks about a foundation. Uh, to, tell me if you have inter, understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. What Job didn't know is uh, that the circumference of the earth is 25,000 miles. And for you Canadians, that's 40,000 kilometers, all right? That's the circumference of the earth. The diameter, the, the diameter of the earth is 13,000 kilometers, 8,000 miles. And what God says, I measured it off. You know, I'm, I'm, I, when I created the earth, I created it the exact size I wanted it to be, okay? Now, that's the earth. Now he's going to move into another section. He's going to move into, uh, he's going to talk about water. And I love this too. Or who shut the, in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. In other words, what he's saying is it, the, basically the sea is like my baby. And I made it and then I wrapped it up in swaddling clothes, you know, the, the, and when you, especially in those days, when you were on the sea, your constant experience was fear. I mean, they didn't have the kind of boats and navigation that we have now. And as you're standing at the edge of the ocean, the edge of the sea, and some of you, surely you, you've been able to, to do that. At the, I've been able to stand at the, at the edge of the Pacific Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, the Sea of Galilee. You think of those places, and you just, you look over to the back. I just, sometimes I'll sit at the beach, and I'll sit there in a chair, you know, and, and as the day goes by, the chair gets deeper and deeper in the sand. You know what I'm talking about? When the waves come in, and I'm just sitting there, and it's just so vast. And, and now you got to picture that scene for what he says next. He, he says in verse 11, and said, thus far shall you come and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. And he says to the oceans, this is the boundary line. You can come up to here. So I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I can't remember the name of your lake. I keep, I keep, don't tell me, I keep wanting to call it knock your toboggan or something like that. <laughs> what? What's, what's the name of the lake again? I messed it up. <laughs> what? Okanagan. Okanagan. I, am so, I apologize so much. <laughs> that is a great name. But, but the reason I can't remember it is because <laughs> this doesn't have anything to do with what I was going to talk about. But, uh, so um, at, I've been staying with the Campbells, you know, and their little girl keeps bumping her head. And I said, oh, there you go, knocking, knocking your noggin again or something like that. So lake, anyway, here we go. <laughs> So that's the water. Okay, now you got the earth, you got the water. Now he's going to move on to another area of creation. He says in verse 12, Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? That's light. So, so God's in charge of the dawn and, and the rotation of the earth and the revolution of the sun around the earth. All that, He just keeps going on and on. Um, look at verse 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea? Or walked into the recesses of the deep, the deepest parts of the sea, the Mariana Trench, about seven miles deep. They haven't even mapped it yet. It's so deep they can't even. They haven't. Even, that's a place on you know on our Earth that hasn't been explored yet. It's seven miles. The pressure underneath that much water is so great it, it would crush most vessels. And and he says God's there. I made that. Um, verse twenty one. You know you know for you were born then. And the number of your days is great. Now, if you ever wondered if God was sarcastic, the answer is yes. Look, look what he says there. You know, Job, for you were born then. I got it. This is, I'm not saying God said it like this. I'm just saying. And the number of your days is great. So you see, the, he's being sarcastic. 
And he's using sarcasm very effectively here to say, Job, oh, you, you know, you thought you're going to ask all these questions and you're going to be brave. And, you know, and, because Job has been saying, if I just had an audience with God, I'd, I'd get this straightened out. And now, now God's saying, oh, yeah, well, where were you? <laughs> where were you when I was doing all of this? And, uh, and then he goes, Let me, I'm going to skip over, otherwise it would take forever if I commented on every verse. So now he's going to talk about the stars. So that's verse 32. He starts talking about, you lead forth uh, the Maseroth in their season. These are different stars. Uh, I love this one, verse 35. Can you send forth light, lightnings that, that, that they may go and say to you, here we are? Now what he's done here, this is personification. And he's made lightning into like a person with the qualities of a person. And so what he's saying is, uh, every day, lightning bolts line up in formation before God and say, what are our marching orders, sir? And you see the, the beautiful poetry here? That God sends the lightning bolts wherever we go. Now, we're going to sing indescribable here in a few minutes after we get done with this section. That's the story. That's by Laura's story, the song Indescribable. And, and remember what it says in there, who has what? Told every lightning bolt where it should go. Who, who did that? Where's Laura's story getting her stuff from? Have you seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? This is, this, is, this is right from the book of Job. Let Go back to chapter 38, verse 23, where it says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Have you seen the storehouses of hail? And again, the, the poetic language of, it's like God has these storehouses, the clouds are like storehouses of snow, and whatever God wants to, he opens up the doors, and they just, it just falls out. That's the story, that's Laura's story, song in, indescribable. That's what she's getting to here. And, and so she says the lightning's like that. Hey, and let me ask you this. If God's sovereign over lightning, um, that means the lightning goes where he sends it. it. It does not mean the lightning goes four inches to the right or four inches to the left. It goes exactly where God sends it. Um, I, was, I was sitting in my office, this is about four or five years ago, and I've got a beautiful, uh, we've got, our, our lot has a lot of big oak trees on it, and there was this big, beautiful oak tree right in front of my window, and, and the storm comes up really quickly in our part of the world, and in the other side of town might be completely dry, but you might have just a terrible storm on this side, and I could hear the lightning coming, and, and, and the thunder was, was getting closer and closer, and, and I'm just looking out the window, sitting there at my desk, I'm looking out the window, and I'm, as I'm looking out the window toward Spring Avenue, this, what, what the, where the church is, uh, there's that tree right in front of me. And I saw the lightning hit that tree. And I don't know if you've ever seen that. That is, that is a remarkable experience. If you've ever been that close to it, and the, and the, the sound was instant, it was just like a bomb went off, and t- bark... And limbs just went everywhere because it's, it's split. The tree. It wasn't like the woodpecker. It still stayed up. Uh, but, but you could see now on this, in this, this huge oak tree, there's a split right down the middle of this big oak tree. And there's bark and limbs just, you know, all over the ground. And I'm thinking, you know what I heard from heaven? Oops. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Uh, I... I'm thinking, Lord, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That, I loved that tree. And, and God made that tree and God caused that tree to grow. And he could have stopped the lightning. He could have made it go somewhere else, but it didn't. He, it went to that tree. And, and what God is saying here is I command all the lightning bolts. There are no accidental lightning strikes. Uh, and, and they line up every day and say, where do you, where do you want us to go? Which, which direction? Where, where, do you want us to, where do you want us to go? He sends the lightning bolt. Now, you're going from the atmosphere. So, okay, we've gone, to the, we've gone from the stars way up high. We've gone way down deep into the depths of the sea. Uh, we're going into the atmosphere, and now we're going into a zoo. This is a fun part of Job, if you like animals. So we're going to walk through a zoo, all right? And I'm going to point out a few of the animals to you uh, on your right and on your left. So we're going to enter into the zoo. Here's the first one, verse 39. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? Now what God's saying is, I do. 
I feed the lions. You say, no, the lions feed themselves. But, the, but God is providing for the lion. Now, now, there's a great lesson to be learned here. I'm gonna, it's, you, you see it also in the next animal, and that's in verse 41. Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? So God's saying, I'm feeding the birds. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6? He said, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. He says, don't worry. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. Because he said, look at the birds of the air. If God takes care of the birds of the air, don't you think he's going to take care of you? Now, how does God take care of the birds of the air? Does, does God say, you know, okay, all you birds, you stay in your nest. I'm going to go get some worms and I'm going to dump it in your nest. Is that how he does it? No. The way he does it is the bird is responsible to go out and get the worm. But who provides the worm? God provides the worm. And so the early bird gets the worm. you got to get up early and go get the worm, which is a really strong message to early worms. <laughs> so what he's saying is, the, the, what I'm gonna, the application I'm going to make here is, when I talk about the sovereignty of God, how God's in control of lightning and God's in control of the world and God's in control of the day you die, and, God's in control, and people will say to me, well, if God's sovereign over all things, what are we responsible for? Are we responsible? Do we have free will? Are we supposed to? No. It's like Martin Luther said, God takes care of the birds of the air, but he won't put the worms in your nest. You still got to go to work. And if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That's what 1 Thessalonians says. So, the, so the, yes, we're responsible, and yes, God is sovereign. So God's feeding the lions, and he's feeding the birds, but the lions and the birds still have to go out and get their food. All right, now, here's, here's the next one. He's going to move from uh, these predators to prey animals. And so verse, chapter 39, verse 1, do you know when the mountain goat gives birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Where were you, you know? God, and the mountain goat's one of the most elusive of all the, of, of all the creatures. And, and he's saying, have you ever seen a mountain, boat, a mountain goat give birth? No, God does. That's the omnipresence and the omniscience of God. He goes to the donkeys in verse 5, who has let the wild, this is the wild donkey, go free. So you got elusive animals like goats, you got free animals like donkeys, you got scary animals like a wild ox in verse 9. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Uh, in other words, he won't. God feeds him, but he's not going to spend the night in your barn, eating out of your manger. Uh, the ostrich in verse 13, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they pinions and plumage of love? And what he's saying here, uh, to make a long story short, it, this is a silly animal. Have you ever seen an ostrich? What's the whole purpose of the wings anyway? They're <laughs> flightless birds, and they're, they're flapping their wings. And other, so this is a silly animal, and he, he talks about later how he's, it's kind of a you know, foolish animal because it lays its eggs in the ground and, and all this stuff. But this ostrich, in verse 18, when she rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Why? An ostrich can run 40 miles an hour. Did you know that? When an ostrich runs 40 miles an hour, between the steps of the ostrich, they measure 15 to 20 feet. So a step of an ostrich, when, it's running, when you're going, I don't know, when I go 40 miles an hour, it's at least only 10 or so. But, <laughs> but, but the ostrich is zooming, man. That's why it's laughing at the horse. And God said, I made that. I made that. And, and so these are, these are animals that can be preyed upon. Uh, strength of a war horse. He talks about the horse in verse 19. All right, those are animals on the earth. You see, see what God's doing? He's just piling up the evidence. He's like a, like a lawyer. The evidence is accumulating, piling up higher and higher and higher, making his case, making his case that God is big. Job, you are small. God is big, and we are small. God is strong, and we are weak. God is smart, and we're ignorant. I mean, I know more than I knew, you know, when I was 10, but of all the things there is in the world to know, how much, of all the things there are in the world to know, how, what percentage of it do you know? 50%? No. 10%? 1%? Less than 1%? I mean, they, they can kind of measure this, what's on the Internet right now. But do, what? And God says, I know it all. That's, that's what he's doing here. He's, 
He's reminding Job who he is, his character, who, who this God is of ours. I'm not talking, I'm talking about God tonight because God wants to reveal himself to us for us to remember who he is and he's doing it by taking him on a tour through a zoo. And, and so he gets to the hawk. Now, you, now land animals, you're going up to the animals. The highest of the animals is the hawk that soars in verse 26. In verse 27, is it at your command that the eagle mounts up? So now you got hawks and eagles, migratory birds, highest points. I was riding my bike the other day on the wild ref refuge near our house. And that, this is the closest I have ever come to a bald eagle. I turned the, I turned the corner as a gravel road, turned the corner, and it was it had got some prey down there, and it was just like from me to Wayne back there, and it took off. And I don't know, have you ever been that close to a bald eagle? They're huge. You, you don't realize how big they are. I mean, you can just see that, you can sense the power of that thing as he, as he took off. He, uh, he mentions uh, the other birds, these predatory birds. They're, they're like spies. He says in verse 30, his young ones suck up blood where the slain are. There, he is, there is he. Now, now there's a break. Here's, here's a change. And the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Now Job's going to answer. This is the first response from Job. And Job answered in the Lord and said, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? Okay, good old Job is back. This is our blameless Job. This is the Job of integrity. This is the Job who walks with God. And he responds exactly the way you would hope you'd respond when he receives the correction of God. The greatest test of maturity is not that you know a lot. The greatest test of maturity is how you handle correction. When the Lord corrects you, how do you receive it? Do you repent? Do you change? And so instead of trying to argue with God, he gets low before the Lord and he, and he submits to him. And he says, I'm of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. He goes like this. <gasps> Lord, let all the earth be silent before he who is the one who made all things. I've spoken once. I'll not answer twice, but I'll proceed no further. But God's not done. He keeps on going because now he's going to talk about more animals. He's talking about the animals on the land, the animals in the sky. So where's he going to go next? Where do you think he's going to go next? Yeah, going, going to the animals in the water. So these are animals in the water. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to skip over some of this. Oh, this is verse 15. Behold Behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Now, this has been a question among scholars for a long time. What is a Behemoth? And th there have been time, different generations who thought that these were sea creatures. Like, I understand you got like a Loch Ness in your lake here or something like that, you know, some mythical creatures, the behemoth. Uh, but actually, I think most uh, um, biblical scholarship is to point out that, that this is referring to a hippopotamus. So a, a hippopotamus is uh, the strongest and the largest of uh, the mammals, of the herbivores that God has created, uh, who, can, who is both on land and water. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins, his power in the muscles of his belly. Uh, an average hippopotamus weighs 3,300 pounds. And even though it hangs out in the water, it can run 19 miles an hour. That's fast. If, you, if, if, the, if, uh, if, the, if the NFL ever found a center who was 3,300 pounds who could run 19 miles an hour, uh, so you got, this is the apex of the herbivores. It's about the size of a pickup truck. God says, I made that. I made that. I love this. Look at chapter 41, verse 1. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? This is probably a crocodile. Uh, now think about this for a minute. Can you, can you do that, Job? Can you manage a crocodile? Can you tell a crocodile what to do? Can you put a rope in his nose, pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Is a crocodile going to beg you for mercy, Job? He's going to ask you to do No, crocodile doesn't need you. Will he make a covenant with you and, and to take him for your servant forever? Will you play? I love this. This is the funniest one. Will you play with him as with a bird, or will you put him on a leash for your girls? 
Now get that picture. He's saying to Job, you, are you so strong and so powerful that you can catch a crocodile and tame him and put him on a leash and bring him home to your girls to play with as a pet? And God is saying, the crocodile is my pet. That crocodile is under my sovereign rule. Now, there's another book of the Bible where God demonstrates his power and sovereignty over animals. There are probably several, but can you think of one that's really, really obvious? We're, do what? That's a good one. Yeah, the ravens came and fed Elijah. But where the whole book is kind of like another zoo, you know. That, that, well, actually, that's good. Genesis and his making it. Noah's another one. Yeah, that's a good one. So you got Noah, you know, I want you to get these animals, and God brings them to Noah two by two. Uh, the, the other one is uh, Jonah. Uh, you know, when, when Jonah, they throw Jonah off the, off the ship, and the Bible says, and the Lord sent a great fish to swallow him up. And then the Lord sent the great fish to, and he said, okay, I want you to throw him up right here on the beach. And that's, when, that's where he threw him up on the beach. And, and uh, there was, a, you know, God made the plant grow up. When jo Joah needed some shade, so God made the plant grow up, got him some shade. And then God sent a worm. Remember what the worm did? Ate into the plant, killed the plant, no more shade. God, Jonah got mad because he lost his shade. So in other words, the, the point is that God is sovereign over all of these things, the most powerful things, the scariest things, the, the most wild things, even crocodiles. That's God's pet. Uh, he says in uh, verse 8, lay your hands on him. Remember the battle and you'll not do it again. That's if you, if you try to battle a crocodile. So, so you keep going through this, and over and over again, this is, what he's, this is what he's saying. He's making the point. This is where you stand. Stay in your lane, Job. Uh, in verse 14, who can open the doors of his face? Still talking about the crocodile. Around his teeth is terror. His back is made of rows of shields shut up closely as with a seal. Can you see that? Have you seen the scales on the back of a crocodile, like armor? Uh, the the, the foot-pound pressure on the jaws of a crocodile is 8,000 pounds. On a Rottweiler, it's 330 pounds. So a crocodile has more pressure in its jaws when it clamps down 24 times more than a Rottweiler. It, keep, it just keeps going on and on. Those are the animals in the water. Now here's Job's response, chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's great theology. He's coming around. He's coming to the Lord. He's not complaining anymore. He says, God, I know who you are. I know that you can do all things. You're sovereign over all the earth. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. And when you get a view of who God is, then you'll see more clearly who you are, and you'll get low before him. There won't be any pride left. This idea that somehow God owes you answers, and he's got to do things your way, that he's got to do, you know. No, he's God. And, and we're not. And, and when Job gets to this position, he knows God now on a level he has never known God. He's never understood God like this before. And when God sees what's happening in his heart, look at verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to, to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you've not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken to me what is right, my, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite, there's the short guy, and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told him and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Isn't that amazing? After all, they weren't there for him. They let him down. They accused him, made all these false accusations. But what did, God, what did Job do? See his mercy? What's Job doing right now? 
Because what happens when you get close to God? When you, when you get close to God, you start reflecting the character of God. You start to become godly. God is a compassionate, merciful, forgiving, gracious God. And, and, and if you are not a forgiving person, forgiven people forgive people. People who receive the mercy of God can show mercy. Loved people love people. And, and so now he's demonstrated the character of God that he's experienced, the kindness, the mercy of God. Verse 10, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who'd known him before and ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. No, they still understand it was from the Lord. This is the decreed will of God. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep. What did he start out with? 7,000 sheep. 6,000 camels. How many camels did he start out with? 3,000. 1,000 yoke of oxen. He started out with 500. 1,000 female donkeys. Started out with 500. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Uh oh, what's going on there? How, what did he start out with? Seven sons and three daughters. So how come this? Is, how come this didn't double? He started out. He he lost seven thousand sheep, but God gives him fourteen thousand back. He he lost three thousand camels. God gives him six thousand back. He lost seven sons and three daughters, and God gives him seven sons and three daughters. And. We are not told in the text, but I suspect it is because, remember I told you last night, there's no developed theology or doctrine of, of, of the eternal state until you get to the New Testament especially. There's no doctrine of heaven and hell clearly spelled out for us until you get to Jesus and the apostles. And what, what God is telling us here in the book of Job is uh, the reason he doesn't double seven sons and three daughters is because Job still has seven sons and three daughters. You see what I'm saying? You remember that I told you a story, um, I can't remember if it was last night or the night before, of the woman in our church, the, the doctor and his wife, who had the 16-year-old boy who was killed in a Jeep accident. Um, so... Um, we had the funeral, and it was one of the best attended funerals. The younger they are, the bigger the funeral. I'm, just, I'm here to tell you. That's the way it is. And by the way, um, coffins come in all sizes because you pay by the square inch. So I've, I've done funerals with really little coffins, and I've done funerals with extra size coffins. And so there's no... Someone who says, well, I got time... I know there's some decisions I need to make. I've got to get right with God. Or I, may, I know I need to straighten things out. But I've got time. And I say to people, you don't have nearly as much time as you think you do. And we had the, the funeral. And I, I got to preach the gospel to a lot of unbelievers, as I do at every funeral, which is what his mom and dad wanted me to do. But I was going to do it anyway. And part of the funeral, we played the, he gave, that young boy had given his testimony when I baptized him. We played his an audio of his testimony of how he came to Christ and was trusting Christ alone for his salvation. And I, I prayed for him, and a lot of people heard the gospel, and they heard him even share the gospel. And uh, weeks later, I was talking with his mom, and she says, you know, sometimes people will ask me, um, and she has, so it was... It was Matt who died, and Luke is, by the way, Luke is now a, a doctor. He was only about 15 when this happened. That's the brother. And she says, sometimes people will ask me uh, how many children I have. And she says, I have two. You know, a lot of times people, if they had a, a son or daughter die, they say, well, I have one son, and, and I, I had a son. Talk, she always says, present tense, I have two children. I got one on the earth. And I got one in heaven. 
And, and when we get to this point here in Job where you only get seven sons and three daughters is because he's already got seven sons and three daughters waiting for him on the other side. So he had them, and God blessed him and restored him. Then he talks about the, how beautiful the daughters were and how God had so kind. Look at verse 16. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons Four generations, and Job died an old man and full of days. All right, that's the book of Job. I, I, I just, I know that's a little tedious, but I wanted to read a lot of that so you get a sense of it. Because now uh, this graph is a graph, it's a chart of Job's life that, that we have been uh, privileged to see over the last couple of days. So you get that chart in front of you. And I just lost all my... All right, so this is the way this works. When we find Job, he's doing fine, right? Everything's fine. And so he is in a state of exaltation. This is, don't get this confused with exaltation. It's E-X-U-L-T. He's exulting, all right? So he's rejoicing. This is a state of uh, rejoicing because he is enjoying the approval of God. And then within just one day, he experiences great humiliation. He's humbled. So, so all that he had that he's really exulting and rejoicing with God, he's, he loses it now, and now he's in a state of humiliation. And in this state of humiliation, he is subject to temptation. The temptation is to doubt God. The temptation is to deny God. The temptation is to disrespect God, to disown God. So he's going through a great uh, period of temptation at this point. And yet he, he passes the temptation. He, he continues to love God even more than his health and his wealth. All right, then, we, with his dialogue with all his friends, he goes through a period of accusation. Accusation. They're accusing him. And falsely accusing him. He's falsely accused of sins. Uh, over and over again. You, you have a secret sin, Job. This is, this is why God is punishing you. We get to the lowest point in Job's life, and he is in a state of isolation at this point. He's isolated. Who's standing by Job? Not his wife. Curse God and die. Not Eliphaz. They think he's sinned. Not Elihu. Not, nobody's standing by. He is all alone. And, and he's, remember, where is he? He's in the dust. He's in, the, he's in the, the garbage heap outside of the city. He is experiencing great isolation. Then there's a point of resignation. And it's, it's, a, it's a, t- a form of surrender where he surrenders as God is now working with him and confronts him. And he says, where were you when the mountain goats were born? Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Uh, can you make a crocodile your pet and bring it home to your daughters and so they can play with it? Yet I made all of that. I'm the maker of heaven and earth, and I'm sovereign over all things. And then Job responds with this resignation, this submission, this surrender to God. That is followed by vindication. In other words, all this time, his friends and everybody else, are looking, they're looking at Job and saying, Job, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And, he's, and Job is just holding on to the idea that, no, someday I'm going to be vindicated because God knows the truth. And finally, when God speaks, everybody sees that Job is now vindicated. Job was right, all right? There's vindication. And after the vindication, there's restoration. All of his health and his wealth, all these things that he lost... All of this is restored to him, but it's even greater than it was before. And as much honor as he had, as much as people respected him and looked up to him before all this happened, look what happens now that he's the greatest man in the land. He's in a, he's in a state here of exaltation. That's with an A. Exaltation. Got it? That's the book of Job. Pretty cool. You see, anything, you see anything else up there that's really, really cool? Who is this? 
That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Before he was born in Bethlehem, before the incarnation, every created being in heaven worshipped him with a perfect worship. And he's glorified in all of heaven. But how many people on earth glorified Jesus? They didn't even know about Jesus. They just, they, they never heard the name Jesus. They, they knew that, that there was one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And, and the idea that this one God exists as three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, consubstantial, co-essential, from all eternity to all eternity, that this one God exists as three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was completely unknown in the day of Job. They didn't know Jesus. This is Jesus before the incarnation. Is the incarnation a promotion for the, the Son of God? Now all of a sudden, he's got some woman changing his diapers. And his breath smelled bad. And he's got to work for a living. It's a carpenter. And this is the great demotion of, of, this, of God the Son. From exaltation where he's glorified in heaven, he comes to earth, he wraps himself in human flesh, he becomes weak. He didn't lose his deity, didn't give up his deity, didn't exchange his deity for a man, humanity. He added humanity to his deity. So that now in this one person, there's two natures. This is God the Son, humiliated. Was he tempted? That's how his ministry started. Go out to the wilderness. First thing that happens. And he is what? Hungry. And Satan says, well, you can turn these, these stones into bread. And, and in other words, do, do, go ahead and try to get your glory, Jesus, without going to the cross, without having to die. Go, go ahead. In other words, curse God and die now, right? Temptation. Was he ever falsely accused? The whole ministry. You're going through John right now, right? Don't you see that over and again? The plots, the schemes, the conspiracies, the perjury. The suborning of perjury. The coming together of equal men trying to figure out how can we trip this guy up and make it look legal and right. So you got a false trial. False accusations. This man is sin, they said. This man claims to be God. This man has committed blasphemy. He deserves to die. Right? Isolation. So now he's nailed to a Roman cross. And he cries out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The disciples have run away. All those followers who were there when he came in Jerusalem the week before, crying out, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday, this mighty, victorious, triumphal entry, and they're all gone. And all the leaders of the world, Caiaphas representing the Jews and Pilate representing the Romans, everyone's left him, everyone. He is all alone. There's nobody standing with him. He is completely, utterly alone and isolated. And nobody is saying, hey, we need to stand up for this guy. And then there's a resignation. Father, not my will, but your will be done. And, and as he's hanging on the cross, where he, he looks out and, he's, and he says, Father, what? Forgive him. These people who have hurt me, these people coming after me, forgive them, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And there's this submission to the Father. This is the ultimate example to us of what it means to surrender to the will of God without being bitter, without complaining, but to say, God, I don't know, but I know that you know and that you know what is best and not my will, but your will be done. That's what this is. It's a resignation to the will of God. What's it followed by? This is Friday. That's Sunday. That's the first day of the week when the women come to the tomb. 
That's the first day of the week when Peter and John go running into the garden. That's the first day of the week when John gets there and first, but he doesn't go in. Peter just rushes on in into the tomb, and the tomb is empty. And Then they see Jesus later on in the day, and the two disciples see him at the on the road to Emmaus later on in the afternoon. And Thomas wasn't there, and he says, I'm not going to believe until I see it myself. So a week later, Jesus shows up again. He says, Thomas, put your hands in my side and, 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 and into the scars of my, uh, of my own palms. And Thomas cried out, my Lord and my God, and fell on his face and worshipped him because now he's vindicated. And everything he said about himself, you can, it, you can claim to be God. Anybody can claim to be God. I can claim to be God. But, but can you back it up? You know what backs it up? Getting raised from the dead. That'll do it. And the, and the vindication of the claim of God. This is why when I tell, talk to people about the gospel, and they say, well, I just don't know. You know, there's lots of religions in the world. And I said, yeah, but here are the thi here's the thing. There are three things that distinguish Christianity from every religion in the world, whether it's Islam, Buddhism, atheism, Hinduism, whatever it is. You pick the religion. There are three things that distinguish Christianity from every religion in the world. Number one, Jesus is the only one who claimed to be God. Buddha didn't claim to be God. Muhammad didn't claim to be God. Uh, the Hare Krishna didn't claim to be God. Moses didn't claim to be God. Only Jesus claimed to be God. This is historical fact. There is no argument about this. He is the only one who made the claim to be God. Now, you don't have to believe he's God, but you have to believe that Jesus claimed to be God. Secondly, only Jesus was raised from the grave. Only Jesus was raised from the dead. There's no other religion in the world that claims its founder is not still in the, in the grave. Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. They're all dead. This is the only religion in the world that says, no, our founder is alive. He was raised again on the third day. And you say, well, how, why should I believe that? And I say you should believe that because the third thing that makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world, and that's historical evidence for the, I'm sorry, let me just add this, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the third thing is, is another G, it's, it's grace and grace means that, that there's no other religion in the world that says that you can be accepted by God because of what someone else has done for you. Every religion in the world says you've got to work for it. There's something you have to do. If you're, if you're a, a, a Muslim, you've got to follow the five pillars of faith. You've got to go to Mecca at least once in your life. You've got to do things. You've got to give alms to the poor. You've got to give. You've got to give. You've got to do. You've got to do. You've got to do. And then Buddhism, uh, Judaism, whatever it is, it is works-based Christianity is the only one that says you're saved by grace alone and not by works. Every religion in the world is spelled D-O. Do, 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 do. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. Christianity is the only religion in the world that's spelled D-O-N-E, done. It is finished. He did it for you. And the reason his death for you means anything is because he's God. And only God is perfect, and only man can die, so God became a man. That's what this is all about. This is why he did this. To, to be the only one who has the qualifications to die in the place of sinners and to be vindicated. Being raised from the dead is the receipt that proves that Jesus claimed all these things and that his payment for our sin was accepted. So do you have Home Depot here? What do you have here? The you have Home Depot? So I learned a long time ago, you go to Home Depot, uh, I used to say, okay, if I was doing a plumbing thing, I would, uh, I'd say, uh, okay, I need this elbow, I need this joint, I need this, you know, and I'd go and get what I thought I needed, and then I'd take it back, and I'd be working on my project, and sure enough, I got the wrong size, or it didn't fit, or I got the wrong thing. So now when I go to Home Depot, I just take a big cart, and I just get everything <laughs> in the cart, and then I take like a whole year's supply of plumbing goods back to my house and finish my little project because I know all I have to do now, I know I'm going to get finished because I got, I got somewhere in this, I got to have all my parts. I, I take all these parts back to Home Depot, and you know what they do? They give me my money back. You know why? What do I show them? I show them a receipt. And the receipt is the physical evidence that the purchase was made. Let me tell you something. If it wasn't for this, I wouldn't believe this. The physical evidence that the payment of Jesus Christ's blood on the cross for my sins was accepted by God, the physical evidence, the receipt, is the resurrection. Now you say, well, why do you believe in the resurrection? So I'm going to tell you. Because of suffering. 
because of suffering. Now, I doubt you make the connection yet, but I'm going to make the connection for you. The only reason I believe Christianity is because of the historical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is more historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived. That is demonstrably true. I wrote a book about that too, and it's in, well, it's in other books as well, but I don't have time to go through all of it. I'm just telling you, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is insurmountable. Uh, if, Jesus, if, that, if that evidence is dismissed, you have to dismiss just about every serious claim of all ancient Near, Near East history based on the quality of evidence there is for the resurrection of Jesus. You say, okay, we know that that is the testimony of those first century disciples. They say, I saw Jesus raised from the dead. And here's what a lot of people like to say. They say, well, I think those people just made it up. They fabricated the story. They made up a religion. So now they have to stop and think of what they're saying. They're saying that in the first century, after Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross, that his body was stuffed into a tomb, and then that Saturday night after he is crucified and executed, a band of disciples get together and say, hey, what y'all want to do? I don't know. What y'all want to do? That's, that's how they talk. They were Southerners and their disciples. <laughs> and said, I tell you what, let's go over there to that garden tomb. And and we know there's Roman soldiers guarding it, and they put a Roman seal on the stone. Let's go over there. Maybe, let's just wait for those Roman soldiers to go to sleep. And by the way, for a Roman soldier to go to sleep on his post meant that he was going to be executed by death. He he was going to be, that that was a capital crime for a Roman soldier. You fall asleep while you're on duty. But let's say all of them fall asleep, and when all of them fall asleep, which they're not going to, we're going to move this tomb, and we're not going to wake any of them up. We're going to be real, real quiet, and we're going to go into the tomb, and we're going to pick up the body of Jesus, which now weighs 120 pounds more than it used to because it's wrapped up in linens and spices, and we're going to tiptoe by these Roman soldiers who are the most elite fighting force on the face of the earth, trained to defend nine square feet of ground, and we're going to get by them with this and we're going to dispose of the body, then we're going to tell the world that we saw Jesus raised from the dead and start a new religion that's going to get us and all of our family killed. And they said, oh, sign me up. Because you know what happened to the disciples? There's only two reasons why you lie. You either lie to escape some pain, or you lie to gain some pleasure. Uh, we have an income tax in the United States. And I don't know of anyone who ever lies on it and says, I'm going to overreport my income so the government can tax me more and I'll show them, right? <laughs> if you lie, you're lying to escape pain, not gain pleasure. What possible motive would those disciples have to lie and say, I have seen Jesus raised from the dead if they have not seen Jesus raised from the dead? Because they suffered for that testimony. They were beaten. They were thrown in prison. They were, their good, their, their life's possessions were taken away from them. They lost their freedom. They lost their health. They lost their wealth. They lost their status. They lost their families. They lost their friends. And 11 of the, 10 of the 11 that are left after Judas were killed. They lost their lives. And you say, well, religious people do that a lot. You know, they they die for their religion. And I say, you know, okay. And they'll say, you know, you know, they strap explosives on their bodies and then they go in the marketplace and blow themselves up, or they, you know, hijack a plane and blow themselves up. I say, okay, that's true, but that's not what these guys did. Because while many people will die for what they think is true. Nobody dies for what they know is false. And that's big. Let me say it again. Every day this happens, a lot of people will die for what they think is true. But nobody dies for what they know is false. And if Jesus was not not raised from the dead, nobody knew that better than the disciples who were making up the story. So I'm going to tell you something that sounds strange. I'm glad they suffered. 
I'm glad they were beaten. I'm glad they were thrown in prison. I'm glad they cut James' head off. I'm glad they cut Paul's head off. I'm glad they crucified Peter upside down. I'm glad they ran a spear through the heart of Thomas. I'm glad. Because they suffered, I know that their testimony is true. Because if they had signed a book deal and got rich and healthy and wealthy by saying they saw Jesus, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I wouldn't believe this story. I wouldn't believe it. It's because they suffered. You say, what possible good could come of my suffering? (laughs) They're standing there at the cross just a few minutes before Jesus dies and gives up his, and he's standing there, they're watching their best friend die. They're watching him leak out his life blood into the dirt. And they got to be standing there on Friday saying, what possible good could come of this? And then on Friday, after that Friday, on that Sunday morning, they know. Oh. And then it starts to make sense. Because what happened to Jesus for 40 days in his resurrected state? He disciples his disciples more for 40 days in between the resurrection and the ascension. People say, well, that's, you know, what what did they ask? What would you ask? Man, that's great. If you had 40 days with Jesus, that's when you got it. Okay, now, Jesus, I just want to get this straight. One more time before you leave. And that's how you get the Gospels. That's how you get Matthew. That's how you get John, right? And, and then there's restoration of Jesus as he ascends to the Father. And then you take, go to the book of Revelation, and John the Apostle peels back the curtains into the future. And there is a myriad of creatures in heaven crying out, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And there's great exaltation. When Jesus used to be known and famous all over heaven, now his fame is growing not only in heaven, but all over the earth. And someday, every nation, every single nation of the earth will come before him and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, the Father in heaven. And I believe it because of suffering. Jesus suffered. The disciples suffered. I'm glad they suffered. And you say, well, we don't have to. (laughs) When did it... I watch people say they're Christians and they love... And then then they get a little bit of pushback. and, And then it's, well, it's too hard now. And I I want to say, when, when did you ever think this was going to be easy? Who told you this was going to be easy? What does Jesus say? If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Take this up. Learn to suffer. I'm going to spend the rest of my life teaching people in my nation to get ready. Because it's been easy. It's never been easier to follow Jesus than the last 100 years in a place called the United States of America. I tell people in Decatur, Alabama, if you can't, if you, if you can't follow Jesus in Decatur, Alabama, you can't follow him anywhere. That, that's as easy as it gets. We got more church members than people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, if you ask every church, how many on their roll, I'm sure it's greater than, you know, it's true greater than the population of our city. And so, is Job relevant? It is so relevant. It's so relevant. That's a good place to stop. Father, we come to you in humility. Uh, we, We are very easy to complain. It doesn't take much for us. And it doesn't take much for us to Um, kind of pull back on following you too. I think what Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed. But it's easy to get embarrassed, easy to be ashamed, easy to say this is too hard. 
When I think of what you call us to do just in terms of the body of Christ, the commitment of church membership, the, the words of Jesus in John 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples. As you love one another as I have loved you. I, I pray for Potter's House Community Church. And I pray that you'd help them understand even to a greater degree that being called to follow you means that they've been called to suffer. They will encounter difficulty. They will encounter evil people who will resist them. They'll encounter disease. There will be colds. There will be cancer. There will be coronavirus. There will be bad weather. There will be downturns in the economy. And there will be resistance and there will be persecution and there will be ridicule and mocking and scorn and insult. This is not unusual. Help us to see this is the norm for your people. It's not the norm for someone who trusts you with all their heart to experience health and wealth and prosperity. It's the norm to, to suffer loss, to follow in the steps of our Savior who lived for us and died for us and was buried for us and raised for us, who ascended to heaven, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, who's coming again to judge the living and the dead, coming again for us. And I pray that you'd teach us to know him and love him and obey him and exalt him more for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing to our indescribable God.
Well, you guys can have a seat for a sec. Steve, I just, on behalf of our church, I want to say thank you um, so much for coming uh, and, uh, and sharing with us. And so, so yes, you're greatly appreciated. And uh, um, I think uh, it was Bruce already planning your next trip um, up here last night. So, uh, so yeah, just uh, let us know when you're available and uh, we'll be happy to have you back. But seriously, thank you so much um, for coming. So. I saw Steve had something here um, that he didn't get to. Uh, does any, anybody know this? What, what, what he might have been doing here? Any, anybody remember this? Looks familiar. Ben's got it. Okay. Man, I can do that illustration more because they don't remember it. So that's great. But no, the good old file folder illustration that I've used with you guys that shares the gospel but uh, I got it from him um, and so that's the way way it works um, but yeah thank you everybody for coming uh, we're glad that you're here I'm glad that you've come uh, I don't know about you guys I would kind of like to sing the theme song one more time could you can we do that all right so band, band can I throw you that out on you Lyndon you got it in you yeah. we've all been commenting on the workout you get with this song so <laughs> Let's stand up and sing. <laughs> 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 